if we are ready with our AV and speaking uh, equipment. So, Ricardo, please welcome Ricardo Salvador. Thank you very much, Aaron, and I want to thank all of you for being here uh, so early in the morning. You always wonder whether there's going to be anybody in the audience when things get going this early. And uh, I want to start actually by gushing uh, a little bit, not only because of what we've just heard, um, but also because of, of Aaron. And so let me explain that uh, a little bit. Um, I, I still uh, get excited when I come up to Twin Cities, and that comes from having lived in Ames, Iowa for nearly 30 years when I was on the faculty at Iowa State. And, uh, you know, it's a little town of about 50,000, or was when I was there, and so coming up to the Twin Cities was coming up to the big town. And, you know, we'd do shopping and bring the kids to the science museum, do things of that sort, so I still have that kind of sense whenever I come up to, to Twin Cities. But the real reason why I want to gush is that one of the things that happened while I was at Iowa State was that uh, there was a little bit of a golden era where a number of relatively young uh, faculty or mid-career faculty, some of us who'd been there for a while and then many who'd come in from different places, had the idea that we needed a curriculum in sustainable agriculture. And I'm talking to you about the 1990s, and so this wasn't an easy idea to bring up at the time. And uh, this group of people eventually established a graduate program in sustainable agriculture, which is the first of its kind within the land grant system. It offers master's degrees and PhD degrees, and for a time back then, it offered MBAs in sustainable agriculture. I'm not sure whether that part uh, is still going. But that program actually launched officially in the early 2000s. And you often wonder when you do those sorts of things what the outcome uh, is going to be. And I can tell you that one of the outcomes, at least, is that those alumni are now populating uh, faculty and the leadership of many key organizations in sustainable agriculture across the country. So for instance, we've got faculty at uh, Michigan Tech, uh, at the uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, here in Minnesota at St. Cloud State, uh, we've got extension agents at uh, Colorado uh, State. And of course, Erin is one of our graduates. She's running Greenland's Blue Waters. The president of the Land Institute, who is here, Fred Utzi, is one of the graduates of the program. I think probably in the first cohort of that, that program. And so we could keep on going, and, but it is uh, something that is very inspiring uh, to see uh, the young people of that era now assuming their leadership positions and thereby the idea of sustainable agriculture actually being institutionalized uh, within the land grant system. I can't tell you how impossible that seemed in the 1990s. And so it is with the ideas that we're discussing here today. It may seem impossible to convert the carpet of corn soy across the Midwest or of wheat to the west of us into something that is better for the environment, but you are the folks that are investing, that are investing in that vision. So um, I want to get started by actually warning you. I actually have to warn you two or three more times during this uh, session here that um, while we at the Union of Concerned Scientists are, of course, just as interested, if not actually as obsessed as you folks in this room are with the idea of continuous living cover and of transforming the land cover um, of the agricultural area of the United States, um, I'm actually not here to talk to you about that. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, refer to the funny way that we give uh, directions sometimes where I grew up. I'll explain more about this in just a little bit. Southern Mexico in a place that's called Oaxaca. So we'll give you instructions like this. You want to go see uh, Mr. Luna's farm. And so we'll say something like, well, you see that hill over there? Um, well, if you go over that hill, on the other side, there's a little brook that's running past. And there's a little bridge that you'll see there. And if you go across that bridge, then the road forks. And if you go to the left, you go over to Lorenza's ranch. She's a widow. Husband died about 10 years ago. She has some chickens. If you actually go over there, she'll offer you some soup. It's some of the best soup you'll ever have. But don't go over there. That's not where Mr. Luna's farm is. And so the, you know, the directions will go like that. So this is a little bit like that. I, I want to tell you that at the Union of Concerned Scientists, one of the things that we're doing that is 
in a high degree of conformity and support with what you folks are doing here in what we consider from DC and the world of advocacy, uh, the trenches. What you folks are doing in the trenches is something that we are supporting as vigorously as we can by trying to get federal laws to support in the sense of sending resources your way, knowledge, uh, financial resources, and so on. And so there's a number of things that we advocate for that you will find very familiar. One is the reintegration of land uh, and livestock, you know, reversing that trend that uh, Wendell Berry um, talks about where we took a perfect system and divided it into two problems. So we're trying to reverse that. Uh, as well as advocating for healthy soil practices and uh, the whole suite of agroecological approaches to agriculture, which is in a sense what you folks are about in Greenland's Blue Waters. So I'm going to do the same thing as with directions to uh, Mr. Luna's farm. I'm not here to talk to you about that. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the way that agriculture looks and the way that agriculture should look. And when you hear that, I know that immediately you're thinking about grass waterways and stream buffers and a polycultural system that's in your mind. You can envision that in the future. We want that as badly as everybody in this room. But when I say that I want to talk to you about the way that agriculture looks, I'm talking to you about the people within agriculture. Without people, there is no agriculture, so I can't separate those topics. So you'll see why this, I hope at least, you'll see why this is a topic that is inseparable from the notion of how agriculture should look. So there is a heroic vision of the agricultural uh, system that most of us have. And for uh, many of us, it's actually our identity and maybe even our driver, you know, this notion that um, a land that was bare and open and unproductive was settled, domesticated, and made one of the most productive agricultural basins on the planet. It's a mythology because it doesn't begin to tell you the fullness of that story and what it signifies. But because of the fact that it does represent the effort of generations before us to create their utopia, you know, they saw this as an opportunity to remake the world from scratch, and we are living with the consequences of their vision and their decisions today that we need to take some lessons from that experience and that intent that they had, the opportunity that they had when it seemed like the horizon was wide open and they could invent the world that they had in their minds uh, all the way back to the 1600s and throughout the middle 1800s. And so uh, these folks, at least in this part of the world, uh, had settings like this, and when they saw that, uh, let me quote to you from one of the original uh, settlers who actually wrote down his perspectives, uh, Mr. Christopher, just in 1751. What they thought was all the way to this place is fine. Rich level land, well timbered with large walnut, ash, sugar trees, cherry trees, etc. Well watered and full of beautiful natural meadows covered with wild rye, bluegrass, and clover. It abounds with turkeys, deer, elks, and most sorts of game particularly buffaloes. You can imagine sort of like images that you see today on PBS of the Serengeti. They were looking at those sorts of settings across the Midwest grasslands. In short, it wants nothing but cultivation to make it a most delightful country. And this is what these folks set about to do. Now, as a result of that, uh, I'm going to uh, enumerate some of the consequences of this. At the time, there was this notion of thoroughness, which in the modern parlance has become our uh, object of worship, efficiency. In the pursuit of efficiency, we have licked productivity. Uh, speaking to you as an agronomist, we understand what it takes to become as productive as possible per unit of land and per unit of labor. So that today we're about five times as productive as those original settlers. Uh, when they, quote, opened up this area and began to act out on their dreams and their visions. But there are consequences to that single-minded focus to what was then a limiting factor, which was how can you stoke productivity? And it basically has to do with models about how we actually focus on just one thing, you know, feeding that grain to livestock, uh, linearizing the hydrological system so that the waste, whether we intend to or not, is flushed throughout that system, 
and together with soil sediment, we actually concentrate those in public waterways and make it so we actually live in cesspools these days. Literally, you can't go swimming in public areas. You have warning signs that say, be careful, you can't recreate here anymore. You folks are attempting to do something uh, about that, as I've said, and, and we support you. Now, why is it that this particular aberration has occurred, where folks that had the opportunity to recreate the world, and we're actually dealing with one of the urgencies of their time, which is how can we come up with sustenance? It wasn't in their time about surplus production. It was about actual sustenance, sustenance and livelihood. Well, it has to do with a uh, mismatch that we need to resolve if we're going to overcome what they have bequeathed to us in terms of the agricultural model. And uh, what you see here is the curve that you see often. I promise you, you're not going to hear the, the um, uh, orthodoxy that you often hear when you see this population curve, which is about uh, feeding the world, that, that whole doxology that you're all familiar with. I'm showing you this basically to illustrate the mismatch between our software and our reality, and I mean our mental software, the operating system that justifies the things that we do day in and day out. Uh, even if I did show you our estimates, our best estimates of how population growth on the planet has gone, really the operational part is this part uh, that I'm showing you right now, the hockey stick of, of global population. What I want to point out is that at the time of the inflection of this curve, we had the so-called opening up and settlement of this continent, including the part of the world that we're sitting in right now. And it is also coincident with the period of time when we were uh, of necessity coming up with the foundations of what today we call the economic theory and economic thought. There, there was no formal study of economics prior to the period of the, about the 17th century when there was massive effort in colonization. And economics, which we're going to dwell on a lot this morning, was necessary because of the fact that it is, if you had to describe in a single line, the study of how you make choices, how you make the best decisions. Uh, if it's been a long time since you studied economics, you know that in chapter number one, this is laid out as uh, opportunity costs. When you, do, when you decide to do one thing, you're deciding not to do any number of other things. And when systems become sufficiently complex, you actually need assistance in order to work out whether the thing that you're going to choose is better than all of the different alternatives. And so this was something that was very germane and operative at the time that Europeans were colonizing the rest of the planet and the world was rapidly becoming complex. So it was during that period of time that this country was opened up and settled, and I keep saying in quotations, opened up, um, that these ideas of economics were born and have not been updated uh, very well since that period of time, which is significant. Now, as a symbol of that, you're all familiar with one of the major testaments of, of that era, which is Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Uh, that book was published in a year that you can't forget because it's memorable for many other reasons, but it was the year 1776. So in the year 1776, Adam Smith publishes this book, but he'd been working on the thing for about 17 years prior to that. And you can say that a cycle of intellectual thought that was kicked off by this particular work wasn't consummated until about 1880, which is the amount of time that it took a German thinker who'd settled in, in England to do a full critique of what the implications of the ideas that Adam Smith set out in this work would be. And that, as you know, was Karl Marx. Now, um, I don't want you to do hex signs at me because I've brought up Karl Marx, but you should be aware, uh, and probably folks in this room are fully aware, that he saw the ideas that Adam Smith laid out as essentially being a formula for history. Uh, as we'll cover in just a little bit, some of the earliest economic thought recognized that there were ways in which we built our wealth, very concrete ways that could be identified so that intentionally we could build our wealth. That's the whole premise of this book. And Karl Marx noticed that it isn't just in the abstract that we have what at that time were called the factors of production. It is that there are people involved, and specifically that there are owners of those factors of production, and there are workers who are generating wealth but don't benefit because they're not owners, and that they would be naturally in tension with each other, 
but that owners would build wealth and therefore would acquire power, especially political power, and their interests would win over those of workers, which meant specifically the interests of farmers at that time, um, because this was the era when industrialization was picking up, and so the idea of industrial workers was a fresh thing. Um, and the consequences of that, Marx predicted, would be that wealthy people would gain influence over government. Government would side with the interest of the wealthy against the interest of the working class. So this is where we are in 1880. It was during this period of time that our ideas of economics developed. Now notice, at this time, it did seem reasonable that the planet was an infinite source of the resources that humanity would need. It did seem reasonable at that time that the planet was an infinite sink for the waste that we were generating. So we continue to operate with the precepts that were generated at that time, and it essentially means that we're operating with a 17th and 18th century mentality, but yet with 21st century realities in terms of global population and of our effect on the planet. So I'll point out just one thing that you can see perfectly in this illustration. At that time, there were one billion of us on the planet using round figures. Today, we're approaching eight billion. Uh, the younger people in this room will see a population of nine or 10 billion, according to the latest estimates by the middle part of this century. And so we can't continue to operate with the precepts of the 16th and 17th century and the reality of the 21st century. And uh, E.O. Wilson, biologist that many of you are familiar with, has captured this perfectly, uh, at least in my conception, with this observation. Uh, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, universities would be one example of that, and godlike technology. So we have tremendous power to wreak havoc. Uh, in essence, and uh, we do so with relish. Now, um, when I said that I'm here to talk to you about the way that agriculture looks, one of the reasons for specifying the human aspect of this is that in the conception uh, of that early economic thinking, humans were essentially uh, erased. I mean, there was this concept that humans were algorithms, that we all acted in our self-interest. That was one of the key insights of, of Adam Smith that he hoped to turn into collective uh, benefit. But you're all familiar with the way in which the algorithm was actually uh, named. Uh, we were reduced to rational agents. In other words, it was supposed to be understandable what would be the best choice for all of us. Um, and so, uh, in essence, many aspects of what we would all consider to be the core of our being were completely discounted, uh, and we were just turned into uh, self-interested, rational agents who would look, say, for the most that we could buy for the least cost that we could pay. This was, uh, in essence, what those theories said. And one of the consequences of that was that trend that you see here, uh, about which we could say so much, and I'll just make one or two observations. What you see a, a picture of here is how people don't matter. Profit matters. Uh, ownership matters. Uh, marketing uh, matters. Productivity uh, matters. And we tell ourselves that all of these things eventually redound to benefit to humans without actually stopping to remark, unless this is something we really focus on for a while, that that may be true for some humans, but not all uh, humans, and especially those involved in this particular system, because you can see that after a maximum of uh, farming numbers and thereby farmers that occurred in the middle of two centuries uh, ago now, essentially the story of agriculture has been the replacement of farmers, not the replacement of farms. That land, as you can see, has been fairly constant, but more and more land has been concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. Now, this is, this is you all, first of all, live it and, and have heard it many times, so this is no revelation. What may be uh, perhaps a little bit more interesting to uh, talk about is that this actually was uh, an intent per uh, economic precepts and uh, let me go back here, I'm getting ahead of myself. So per economic precepts, um, 
I'm going to illustrate to you the outcome of this particular study, which was conducted in the late 50s, very early 60s. Uh, it was a commission that was set up to study what they called the problem of agriculture, and uh, the problem was that there were too many farmers. They, they specifically stated this. What are we going to do to move people off the farm? And the logic was that the productive capacity of agriculture was exceeding markets, and that if you extrapolated, you would see that that was essentially going to be a, a perpetual uh, program, problem for agriculture. And, and that, historically, was justified. From the time that the uh, western part of the country was opened up to agriculture, and again, quote, opened up, um, that surplus had been the problem of agriculture which led to low prices. And at first it was because tremendous amounts of land were open up to production, that created surpluses. And the uh, boom and bust cycles of agriculture that you're all familiar with to this day. But then after the Second World War uh, and the era of inputs and fossil fuel driven agriculture, that was uh, uh, even made worse. And so there was this crisis uh, in the rural countryside and in agriculture that demanded that the government take a specific look at it. And their conclusion was, and these, by the way, were people, they were the CEOs of AT&T, of Ford, of Sears. You know, they, uh, agriculture was seen as a business, and so let's get the most successful business uh, people to give the government advice about how to conduct its programs. And they recommended, now they do talk about alternatives in, in this study, but they essentially recommended uh, if you take a look at the population of uh, farmers at that period of time, we're talking about a population of about 3 million farmers uh, then. Uh, they recommended that uh, clearly there was a surplus of farmers and about 2 million farmers needed to be removed from the land. And so government policies were put into place that essentially reflected that, that perspective. We need to support enough farmers that the food supply is secure, of course, but we had an excess of farmers to accomplish that objective. The important thing is that we have sufficient farmers utilizing the appropriate technology to be able to generate the agricultural output that was uh, required, and that was the extent of the rationale uh, of this period of time. So we're living with the consequences of those policies and that particular uh, insight. And I, uh, whenever uh, this is covered, I always uh, stress the poverty of the imagination that is revealed uh, by that. You're all familiar with the options that are usually laid out. One way of explaining this is to say, well, you know, what are you going to do? We're all about efficiency. We're all about technology. You know, we're about modernity. Who wants to live with the drudgery of the eras in the past? Or are you suggesting we should be producing less? And the reason why this reflects the poverty of the imagination goes to the point that I made in introducing this graphic and telling you that it's a picture of how humans don't uh, matter, is that clearly the well-being of those farmers was not a primary consideration. To the extent that it was, it was thinking along the lines of, well, they'll be better off as workers in urban areas, so let's get policy that will drive people to urban areas and re-educate them and you know, integrate them into urban life. That was literally the, the conversation. And in places around the planet that are right now replicating that dynamic, that's, that's literally the, the conversation. I'll explain to you in a little bit that I'm standing in front of you because of that sort of reasoning in the country where I was born. And so uh, here are the two choices that are typically put uh, before us when we look at a chart like this. It, it is, well, um, you know, uh, because we're so productive, and particularly if you're into commodity agriculture, which is uh, low cash value, then you need to have very large extensions. Uh, all of us have friends in places like Montana that will look at you straight in the eye and say, yeah, you need at least 10,000 acres in order to be able to make it in wheat, with a straight face, very little thought behind that. Or you could look for the, the, um, the miracle niches where you're producing very high cash value crops, and therefore you need uh, only uh, small acres in order to make it. We're always looking for those niches, and they always go through cycles. Maybe we'll be hemp this time. So you're all familiar with those sorts of ways if you've been around uh, long enough. So to have those two options is the thing that I'm referring to as the poverty of the imagination, without laying out the actual needs that we have as humans, as society, and stopping to, uh, the tendency to think of this as just an agricultural output uh, system. 
and factor in all of the other factors uh, or considerations that should be a part of that. So um, I'm going to call in some uh, reinforcement here to begin working on the idea of the human cost of the system that we have right now and what we need to do about it. And the reinforcement comes in the form of the former Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, Mr. Vilsack um, used to go around to primarily non-farming audiences and try to inform them uh, about what it was like to live in the rural United States, and he wanted to inform them who farmers were. Um, and so I'm going to show you uh, one of the arguments that he used in order to talk to non-farming audiences about who farmers were. Now, uh, we'll see whether the audio works here, and if not, then we'll okay, uh, improvise. So I'm call in some reinforcements here. I hope that folks would understand uh, the situation of the American farmer. And I don't expect you necessarily to be totally sympathetic, but I want you to know who these people are. You know, for the most part, uh, there are about 2.2, 2.3 million people that are characterized or qualified as farmers under our survey at USDA. It only takes uh, the ability to raise about $1,000 of product for sale to be a quote unquote farmer. About 1.3 million of that 2.2, 2.3 million are folks who are doing something in the back of their home out in a rural area. Uh, they may be growing some strawberries, they may be uh, growing some apples that they turn into cider and every year they take it down the farmer's market for a couple months. They sell a couple thousand bucks worth of stuff and, and it's a good thing that, that it's taking place. But they're not making any money off this, they're just doing it because they enjoy doing it. So that leaves about a million people uh, that we, uh, if you went out and talked to the person on the street, would ask, you know, Define for me a family farmer. That's probably they're probably talking about these people that do farming, if you will, for a living. Of that number, about seven hundred thousand of that number are small to medium-sized operators uh, who sell less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of product. In the best times we've had in agriculture in the last six or seven years, record exports and in some in some day, a years record income. These folks averaged about $10,000 from their farming operation. $10,000. Which means that the vast majority of that six, 700,000 folks, they are working on the farm, they're working off the farm, and their spouse is working on the farm and off the farm. They struggle, but they love the land, they're connected to the land, and they want to stay in the land, and we want to help them. And then you've got the other two to 300,000 that are commercial-sized operations, and they're doing pretty well. Okay, so uh, you've heard a whittling down of that nominal figure that you hear all the time that there are a little bit over two million farmers in the nation. And as the Secretary of Agriculture has informed you, there's nothing of the, of the kind. As a matter of fact, uh, you heard him conclude at the end that there's about maybe 300, 400 commercial farmers that are doing well in agriculture. That, that may be. Uh, two weeks ago, I came from a, a closed conference with one of the major agricultural input uh, companies uh, in the nation, and they said wide openly, uh, well, it wasn't wide openly, Chatham rules, so, uh, but what they said was, really, we think that's just about 60 to 70,000 farmers. Those are our clients. Those are the people that are generating the majority of agricultural uh, output. So uh, the secretary concluded that essentially nobody farms these days. Uh, you know, you're in the agricultural bubble, so it may not seem like that. You may farm, and everybody you know uh, may farm, but when you look at a nation uh, of over 300 million people, you know, approaching 320 million people, 60 to 70,000 uh, farmers producing the majority of agricultural output, or 300 to 400,000 people that are actually making a profit uh, in agriculture, that's nobody. Nobody is performing agriculture, and that's one of the consequences of the extrapolation of everything that I've just described uh, this morning. Now, let me uh, show you uh, an illustration that, again, will be no surprise. All of you are familiar with uh, these data. What you see across the x-axis here uh, is a, a classification of farms by size, the number of acres that they uh, represent. And uh, you see the distribution there, and this is in percentage. Again, in percentage, what we'll add here is the number of acres in each of those farms. And a quick English translation of this is that currently about 11% of the nation's farmers manage 70% of the nation's farmland. 
uh, they may not necessarily own all of that land, but they manage that amount of, of land. So again, all reinforming that people have not uh, mattered. Some people, a very small fraction of people, are doing very well within the scheme. But can you imagine if way back in the 1860s, uh, uh, when uh, Lincoln was uh, campaigning for president, and he had this idea that eventually became the land-grant university system, and this vision for how the well-being and livelihood of farmers would be improved by public investment and in generating knowledge and uh, supporting these farmers, suppose that he'd said something along the lines of, uh, there's just a catch. And the catch is that for us to be able to do that for you, 98% of you will have to disappear. Then the calculus might have been different for everyone involved in this, all the way from farmers to the policymakers that were involved. But even though that caveat could reasonably have been made at that, that period of time, uh, we have observed nothing of the sort. And so we're living with the consequences of this as well. Now, uh, I'm going to guess nobody's startled by anything that has been stated so far, and in fact may just be affirming of, of you know, all of the things that you all are trying to solve you know, in this um, uh, difficult simultaneous differential calculus kind of problem that all of us uh, confront. Now, uh, let me add something that the Secretary did not mention that he could very well have mentioned, or anybody that talks about farming in the United States and farmers in the United States needs to say to completely draw the picture of who farms and one of the reasons why farming has the characteristics that we have in the United States today. And it is this. It is one of the whitest occupations, as a matter of fact, in about 10 seconds, I'll tell you that it's actually the whitest occupation in the United States. But using uh, data from the Department of Labor, let me show you just the upper decile, you know, so the upper 90% of occupations classified by ethnicity. So we go all the way up to the top, and here you see what I mean. Uh, farmers and ranchers, so this means the actual owners, uh, proprietors uh, of farms in the United States, are 95.8% white. You see that the only other occupation that is whiter, not by much, but it's 96.5% are veterinarians. So this is why I said you'll, you'll understand why I can lump both of these two together and say this enterprise, uh, agriculture, livestock management, is a completely white operation uh, in the United States. And how does that happen in a nation that is far from 96 or 97% white? It obviously doesn't just happen. It obviously is an engineered outcome. And what I'm going to argue by the time that I'm done is that we all have an interest in making sure that we do something about this unnatural social engineering that explains farming today. Remember, we're human beings. We have objectives. We have intentions. And one of the ones that we're uh, witnessing today is the outcome of who farms and what they thought that they were doing. So let me talk to you uh, about that. And uh, I, I should preface this uh, by saying that this is important because obviously not everyone involved in agriculture, you know, going all the way from the wide end of the funnel, which is everybody who uh, eats, you know, down to the narrow end of the funnel, the people that are actually doing the production on the land. Uh, will have different experiences of the agricultural system depending on where they sit in the system. So you can be in exactly the same place and have completely different experiences according to who you are. That's actually the, the point that I want to walk us through. Uh, and we're going to talk about this notion of race, but I, I want to preface this by saying uh, that this should not be a, a difficult conversation for us to have. Uh, it may be difficult ideas for us to process, but I don't want anybody in this room to shut down. I'm, I'm looking at you out here, and I think this is a completely white audience. I, I think there's actually one exception back there. Welcome, sister. Um, so, you know, my white friends, I don't want you to shut down on me. I want to give you several reasons why you should uh, be completely open-minded as we walk through this. So uh, one of the reasons has to do, uh, feel free to laugh out loud at this line, that I understand whiteness perfectly. And uh, let me tell you why. Here's Mama. Uh, uh, her name is Ruth. Uh, her maiden name was Fleming. Um, 
She's not doing too well these days, but fortunately she's still uh, alive. And Mama is a Flemish American woman uh, who's part of a family. They were Archies that during the depression in the last century escaped uh, to California and settled in the Central Pacific uh, coast and did very well in dairy. And, and their descendants continue to do very well, but she is one of the saintliest people I've ever uh, met. Literally, she studied Bible school at Biola in Los Angeles, went to Mexico as a missionary. Fundamentalist, evangelical. So I was sitting in church at least four times a week and you know, singing onward Christian shoulders, and I can tell you that I understand whiteness on the basis of my home experience. But what happened was that in Mexico, Mama met the man who was going to be my dad. So she met Ricardo. And Ricardo is a Native American uh, man from Oaxaca, southern a crook of Mexico, the farthest south that you can go in Mexico. He didn't learn to speak Spanish until he was about uh, 12. They were both agricultural families. But it became very obvious to me, and it took me the longest time in, in my personal experience to figure out what it was that was unsettling about the fact that these two agricultural families had two completely different experiences of the agricultural and the food system. So depending on who they were, they experienced it dramatically differently. And the, because I don't want to dwell on this, and you know, thank you for uh, uh, humoring me, uh, talking uh, personal things here just very briefly. The, quickest summary I can give you of this is that the people on my mom's side of the family farming in California would hire people like I have on my dad's side of the family to do the menial work for them. That's how different their experiences were because dad's family eventually went on the migrant trail and I promised to you I'd explain that that was because when it became Mexico's turn to become industrial during the Second World War they specifically chose to drive people from the land explicitly said we need labor in the cities to uh, have people running the factories, and so let's depopulate the countryside. We won't invest in clinics or in schools or in things that keep people on the land. If people want that, they'll have to come to cities. But of course, that didn't apply to Native Americans who were not welcome uh, in cities, and so these folks went on the migrant trail. Some of them ended up here in Minnesota uh, harvesting sugar beets uh, during the Second World War when everybody else was uh, overseas fighting that war. And so I meant it literally when I said that decision about whether people matter or who matters explains why I'm actually standing in front of you at the, at the moment. So if all you knew about uh, me uh, were that my name is Ricardo Salvador, you know that I was born uh, in Mexico, there would be all kinds of thoughts. There would be a story that would come into your head. If I told you one of my parents, I'm, I'm the son of an immigrant, there'd be all kinds of stories that would pop into your head. But I, I'm 100% sure one of those stories would not be, oh, it was my mom, a Flemish-American woman who migrated to Mexico, became an emigre in Mexico, lived there 40 years for all intents, became Mexican, speaks perfect Spanish. That was the immigrant. So um, I, I go to that extent to describe that in that I'm going to talk about the notion of race. and. Um, the notion of racism comes along with that. And I just gave you an example of what I think racism is. It is the notion that if you think you know somebody's race, you think you know anything about them. And um, I started this by telling you that I want this to be a comfortable uh, uh, discussion for all of us. So one is repeating. Uh, I understand whiteness, so I'll be speaking to you from that uh, standpoint. But another reason why I think this should be an easy conversation is that I just want to acknowledge everybody in this room was just born into this system. That's all you did. You were just born into it. Uh, now, there's some caveats that will uh, come along with that. But here's another reason why I think uh, this is good news. I've said two times already, we're living today with the consequences of decisions that people before us made. So our forebears did what they did. We can't do anything to change what they did. We can do something about what we do now and therefore the future that we're going to create. That's the thing to focus on. And then the last thing that I'll say about this, which uh, I think is the ultimate reason for this to be uh, an open-minded conversation, is that this notion of race that I've already appealed to is a handy notion, but it is a completely false notion. There is no such thing as race. 
And so let me explain that. Uh, that I often find is a revelation to, to folks. So what I'm going to do here is call in the reinforcement of the American Association of Physical Anthropology. These folks have put out a statement of race recently because they found it necessary to speak to the notion of race given headlines that here in the 21st century United States you see day on day. And so what they say about race is that it doesn't provide an accurate representation of human biological variation. It was never accurate in the past, and it remains inaccurate when referencing contemporary human populations. Now, let me just insert a quick parenthesis here. Um, as recently as about 40 to 70,000 years ago, that was not the case. Um, uh, so, uh, given all kinds of advances in genomic analysis and taking samples uh, from uh, prehistoric uh, hominins, what we're discovering is that over that period of time, we did seem to overlap with other races of hominins. So Neanderthals would be some of the ones that you would be most familiar with. Denisovans would be uh, another. Uh, Flores humans in today's Philippines. At that, that time, there appeared to be about four different races of hominins simultaneously living on the planet. Now, it proved to be the case that ours, Homo sapiens, on the evidence, was the most ferocious. We're the one that survived, and we're the only one that remains. So biologically, we're all the same species with very, very surface differences among us depending uh, on what part of the planet we've evolved in over the last tens of thousands of years that create those surface differences. However, let's keep going with what these folks say. So humans are not divided biologically into distinct continental types or racial genetic clusters. This is what the biology and the genetics uh, tell us. Instead, this is a Western idea. So they say the Western concept of race must be understood as a classification system that emerged from and in support of European colonialism, oppression, and discrimination. So remember that population curve that I showed you and how it was coincident with colonizing the planet, you know, radiating out from Europe and how we needed ideas. We needed a rationale for what those colonizers did at that period of time. And this was a handy taxonomy, very nice classification system that they came up with, which we're going to go into in far more detail here. So then they say it, does, it thus does not have its roots in biological reality, but instead in policies of discrimination. So because of that, over the last five centuries, race has become a social reality that structures societies and how we experience the world. In this regard, race is real, as is racism, and both have real biological consequences. So I'm dragging you through this to illustrate why there is no basis for race. However, at the same time, we can't just say that and go on with a clear conscience because of the fact that we behave as if race were real, and that has real consequences, that we simultaneously have to recognize race is not real, but we, because we've acted as if race were real, then the world looks different. There is a particular footprint of that belief on the planet right now, and when we saw those charts from the Department of Labor, you saw one of those consequences. So let me march into this by uh, fulfilling uh, uh, what you may have considered a threat early on, which is that we're going to talk a little bit about economics. This will be quick. You won't have to suffer very much. But uh, based on those original notions that we invented, that came straight out of our head um, in the 17th, 18th, going into the 19th century, that today we call economics, a, a social science, um, here is the formula for how we build our wealth. And remember, it's important, I can't say it often enough, that this was coincident with the period of time in which this country was colonized. So the basic precepts of building wealth according to contemporary economic theory are that you need factors of production. These factors of production reduced to three. And so the first of these factors of production is land. It is the necessary one. Everything, belong, uh, everything begins with land. Uh, economists refer to it as the building block, the first step of the primary sector of the economy. So you need land, uh, you know, to those in this room, it's obvious in order to produce uh, food and industrial inputs, but it's the source of everything. It's the source of the raw materials and the minerals out of which we make the gizmos that we're using to show each other fancy pictures uh, right now. Everything comes from either cutting down a forest or extracting minerals from the ground or producing on the basis of uh, fertile ground. And then the second factor of production is labor. 
that's where we take the things that we either have produced or cut off or extracted from the land and convert them into things that have utility. And that third thing is the third factor of production, and that is capital. In the notion of, uh, of an economist, uh, capital is more than what immediately pops into your head when you hear that word. You probably are thinking of financial uh, capital. But to an economist, capital is essentially any manufacturer that has utility, something that has value to us and that we exchange with one another. Now, the fact that we use uh, uh, financial capital to keep score because it's fungible, you know, is kind of incidental to the basic economic idea, which is that there are three things that matter to build our wealth. So land that we combine with labor that renders capital that we exchange with one another. And in the modern conception of uh, economics, there is a, a dominant idea, which is referred to as uh, Ricardo's beautiful idea. And that's not my beautiful idea. It's David Ricardo's beautiful idea, Scottish uh, economist uh, who actually was interacting with Adam Smith and all the people that came up with the original uh, notions of economic theory. And this was his notion of comparative advantage, that if it, each of us on the spot of the planet where we happen to be specialized uh, in a self-interested way in producing the things that we are the best at producing and then we exchange among one another that we're all better off in that. So here in a nutshell is the basic thinking about how we build our wealth. Now, suppose that we were perverse. Suppose that we did not want to have other people build up their wealth. We wanted to build our wealth. You can use this formula in order to produce that outcome. So one thing that you would do is assure that you have land, <clears throat> but not that others have land. Or you would assure that you can gainfully use and be rewarded for your entrepreneurship and your labor, but that others wouldn't. And without those two factors of production, then you don't have capital, you have nothing to exchange, you don't have wealth. If you were perverse, that's how you would do it. And that's the history of agriculture in the United States. So let me walk you through that. And remember, these were generations before us. And so let me illustrate this in one shot that we're going to see twice uh, here before we're done. Here you see an illustration of these made-up racial uh, and ethnic categories that have been so useful uh, to us socially. So along the x-axis, you see the buckets. So you see that we are about two-thirds white in the nation, about 1.3% first peoples. And by the way, this is a generous estimation. This means including people that aren't, quote, 100% Native American, which is almost an impossibility uh, uh, these days. So with the most generous definition, we have 1.3% of the population being first peoples, about 13% African American, about 18% is a goulash that we call Hispanic. It's a goulash because in there you have European descendants, you have Native Americans, you have everything. It's just a goulash. What we mean is uh, they're south of the border kinds of people. So that's our classification for Hispanics. So now I want to compare to that the poverty rate, which in a cash economy, modern cash economy, like the one that we're embedded in, is 100% correlated with hunger. No money? I mean, if you're not producing for yourself and you have no money, then you're going to be poor and you're going to be hungry. So let's take a look at the rates of poverty by each of these classifications. So the first thing to note is that there is white poverty. White poverty runs at about 9%. Uh, uh, sadly, in Minnesota, you're not foreign to this notion. You know where the pockets of rural poverty, rural white poverty, exist in Minnesota. And you also know in the country where these tend to be pooled. You know, in the Appalachian region, for instance, there is a big concentration of white uh, of poverty. However, take a look at the other rates of poverty, which are completely disproportionate to the white rate of uh, poverty. And it is an odd thing that it should be tied directly to people's ethnicity. So if you look at the Hispanic rate of poverty, uh, it is about 20%. Uh, if you look at the African-American uh, rate of poverty, it is about 22%. So you know about twice the rate of white poverty. But if you look at the rate of, uh, oh, let's see, something happened to us here. There we go. So if you look at the, if you look at the rate of poverty among first peoples, you see that that is nearly three, you know, we're not getting past this. Okay. Uh, I often, uh, 
Okay. See, I think I feel it there. I often wonder when uh, when things go awry just at that point in the talk where there's something else going on. <laughs> okay, let's see whether we can. So uh, I was saying that the rate of Native American poverty is about three times the rate of poverty than you experience among white folks. Now, if we just progress on the current of life, in other words, consuming the rationale and the operating system for our society, you know that there are facile observations about this. Well, you know, I've worked for everything that I've got. And if people were just entrepreneurial, and if people weren't so lazy, if people would get educated, then we wouldn't see these sorts of things. That, that's how we can go from day to day when we observe these kinds of uh, realities. Now, we're going to see this again. Uh, uh, if you can, uh, that chart, we're going to see that again uh, in about 15 minutes' time. And uh, we'll have some other observations to make uh, uh, about it. But let's walk through the factors of production, how we built our present wealth. Uh, when the United States is now a $1.8 trillion uh, industrial sector. So factor of production number one is land. And you can see here evidence of how we actually acquired that land in a massive land grab that actually did begin back in the 1600s, but which reached its apex in a concerted uh, government program signed by President Jackson, uh, passed by Congress in 1830, called the Native American Indian Removal Act. So that Congress in 1830 wasn't confused about what it set out to do. They didn't use the euphemisms that today's Congress uh, uses. They laid out exactly what they meant to do. And that was a program that lasted 60 years, from 1830 to 1890, when it was consummated uh, in a uh, notorious massacre uh, not very far uh, from us here. And so what you see illustrated here is what was entailed by that campaign. Now remember, this, this pattern began with settlement. It goes all the way back to the 1600s. But that concerted uh, policy essentially consummated the entire uh, process. And what was then called the Department of the Army, today's Department of Defense, kept inventory and close track of the over 200 uh, what they call battles and skirmishes, the majority of them outright massacres of very small numbers of people at a time that were seeking to defend their homeland. And so, as I mentioned, this was consummated with a notorious uh, massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890. Uh, this was a, a massacre of uh, women, old men, and young kids. By this time, the so-called Indian Wars were de facto over. Uh, but this group of people at Wounded Knee were performing a ghost dance. This was taught around uh, Indian country at that time by a Paiute holy man by the name of Wolka, who told Native people that if they did this circle dance, uh, which is completely, uh, you know, a peaceful dance, uh, that the good times would return. So they were praying and dancing for the good times when they spooked the local garrison and they were uh, massacred in the dead of winter. The uh, person responsible for this band you see here, not in rigor mortis, but frozen uh, to death because it took that army garrison about three days to figure out what they would do with the bodies. His name was Bigfoot. And what they eventually ended up uh, doing reflected this following uh, valuing of Native American life. The Indians are ignorant, they're abject, they're debased by nature, whose minds are as incapable of instruction as their bodies are of labor. They have nothing in common with humanity but the form, and God has sent us to destroy them, as he did to the Israelites of old, to similar tribes. Very common thinking of the time that was necessary to do what that generation of folks was doing at that period of time, a massive land grant. Now, um, I refer to this notion of uh, race and its utility because of what it allowed uh, that generation of people to do. But essentially, it was what today we call othering, you know, devaluing other people's uh, lives on the rationale that these were not humans, these were savages, expressed in this language many times over the, the generations. So what I want to do is compare this to uh, 
the actual convention on genocide that the United Nations drafted, United Nations drafted. And actually, let me, let me uh, go back and show you something about this uh, particular uh, illustration that I neglected to mention. So, um, when you take a look at a scene like the one that you see there, Bigfoot, uh, and I tell you that there were a number of bodies like this that needed disposal and that that garrison needed to figure out what to do uh, with it. That has directly to do with this uh, list of criteria that the United Nations formulated. And I, some of these are really easy to understand, particularly number one, how do you recognize genocide? Well, obviously, you're trying to kill members of a, of a group. But why would you actually need to work out a whole protocol to identify whether you're actually looking at genocide or not? And this had to do with the fact that uh, during the Second World War, Germany had a rationale for acquiring what they called living room, living room, uh, and that it amounted to land grabbing, and it amounted to displacing other people and othering them. And the interesting thing about that is that here eventually is what the army decided to do with those bodies of the people massacred at Wounded Knee, but this happened at around the time that Adolf Hitler was born. Adolf Hitler uh, was born in the late 1800s, and when he was a kid, he described how a favorite game of his and his friends was playing cowboys and Indians. This was the major news of that period of time. And as he grew up, he wrote in Mein Kampf that one of the lessons of the way that Americans handled the Native American population was what he eventually thought needed to happen in Europe to create living room for uh, the Aryan peoples. And so it should be no surprise that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence with what he termed the final solution in eliminating people when it came his turn and what he'd seen the United States do. He patterned what he did on what he saw the United States do with its native population. So there's the easiest criterion to deal with in terms of recognizing genocide. And you, this is the reason why there's a protocol that was developed so that at the trials that followed the Second World War, you could try to pin responsibility for people that actually designed the program for genocide. So did they comply with these five criteria? So did they kill members of the group? The second of these was to cause serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, which was an explicit strategy from the very early days of colonization in the United States. So here, uh, quoting uh, Lord Jeffrey Amherst, he wrote to one of his people in the field, uh, Colonel Bouquet, you will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, as well as to try every other method that can serve to extirpate this executable race. In other words, make them sick, give them plagues that we know they can't resist in order that they will die, which was a very effective formula that was used by missionaries that opened up, you know, opened up the West. The other way that uh, explicitly serious bodily or mental harm was called to members of the group was to say, what is the source of sustenance of this plague? And it is, of course, their food ways. Let's completely eliminate them. And this took various forms depending on whether we were talking about the forest people, the lake people, but when it came to the grass people, it was very simple. It was eliminate the buffalo. And so over a period of 10 years, that herd was essentially disappeared. And because of the fact that that was the source of not only livelihood, nourishment, sustenance, it was part of the culture and uh, dress and ritual and the entire annual cycle, if you wanted to do something to make it so that the life of people suddenly had no meaning, this was one key fulcrum that you would attack and was effective in doing essentially what was intended. And so these folks became dependent. They became dependent on what were initially military rations. Uh, but eventually became what today we call commodity uh, food. Uh, the uh, dregs of the food system, uh, you know, very rich in carbohydrates, and you know, in order to make it palatable, fried uh, and you know, uh, flavored with sugar where possible. One of the worst possible diets that you can imagine, which is unsurprisingly made this population of humans one of the sickest populations on the planet. And so, if you this day want to see some of the most immiserated people on the planet, and mark that word, not miserable people, immiserated people, people made miserable, then go to Wounded Knee, or Pine Ridge, or Standing Rock, or to the heart of the Dene Reservation. And what is there was made, it didn't just happen. You'll find some of the sickest, most immiserated people on the planet not just in the United States, on the planet, some of the sickest people from diabetes and obesity. 
And this was an engineered uh, outcome, so causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Criteria number three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life that are intended to bring about their physical destruction. Well, I've just uh, described that there, there was no meaning if you were not producing your food, uh, hunting your food. You could not observe your rituals. You could not speak your language. There was no meaning to your life. There is, there is absolutely nothing surprising about the despair that you see in the concentration camps that we call reservations today. And there was explicit strategy to keep people there. So some of you may know that if you don't live on a reservation and you're Native American, then you're subject to tax. You're not taxed if you live on a Native reservation. That explains casinos, which is a completely di different topic, as being leveraged for economic development by these Native communities today when they have so few options uh, available to them, and they really do need to be understood in that frame. But you can see why, cut off of all other options, there is no meaning to life, and why you have the high suicide rates and substance dependence that you observe uh, in these Native communities to this day. And so obviously that criteria of genocide is more than amply uh, fulfilled. Uh, imposing measures intended to present births within the, prevent births within the group, well, this took the form of abductions. Uh, children uh, and parents were separated without their consent, without their awareness of what was uh, going on, sent to boarding schools where they were reprogrammed to be white, that was the intent, uh, at least, prevented from speaking their own language, learning their own uh, culture, and the idea was melded into the culture by uh, uh, marrying a nice white boy. Um, and there were several different mechanisms that were used. As recently as the 60s and the 70s, young Native American women at these boarding schools who thought that they were in the care of the Indian Health Service were being forcibly sterilized without actually realizing what was happening to them to prevent reproduction and growth of the Native American population as late as the 60s and 70s. So imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group amply fulfilled. And the last criteria, forcibly transferring children from a group to another group. Well, I already described how that happened through uh, Indian boarding schools. Uh, here's a picture of a group that had just uh, arrived, Chiricahua Apache, at the Carlisle uh, School in the late 1800s. But probably the best illustration I know of this is what happened to Mr. Tom Perlino from uh, Diné, uh, Navajo at that same school just four months after arrival. This was the intended reprogram. And you may say to yourself, trying to be as sympathetic as possible to the people of that period of time, look, uh, if these folks just understood that their time was over and that they did have options, if they just melted into the population, you know, changed their appearance, learned English, you know, got educated, integrated into the industrial culture of that time, then they have the same opportunities as everyone else. And that's conquest. There's no better definition of conquest than that, quote, alternative. And so uh, clearly, what we have is an engineered result at present, and it needs to be understood as such. One way of um, understanding how real and persistent this is, so that we don't just discard this and say, well, that's history, is to compare this band of Chiricahua. On your bottom right, third from the right, you see an individual uh, whose name was Tuhul Hutz. Uh, you would better recognize him by the name that the Mexicans gave him, because he simultaneously fought the Americans and the Mexicans. The Mexicans called him Geronimo. And this picture was taken in Oklahoma as his band of Chiricahua Apache was about to be boarded onto a train and sent as punishment to Florida, uh, you know, uh, literally being uh, sent to the gulag uh, of that period in the United States, because they refused to recognize that they'd been conquered. They kept rising up, exactly the same way all of you would do if you had been in their situation. They kept rising up. So holding that punishment, they'd been sent to Oklahoma, which at that time you know, was Indian country. And then, because they still were bad influence to the rest of the Native Americans there, they were being sent to Florida. Um, this is a persistent reality, as you'll realize if either you participated or at least you saw scenes from the protest just a little bit to our west of two and three years ago against the Excel pipeline, where Native Americans were standing up for the right to protect the quality of their water by preventing an oil pipeline going across the Missouri River and potentially polluting their source of water. Exactly the same fate. Nothing has changed. We're still enforcing 
who makes the decisions and treating these folks, as we say, by law, as wards of the state. They have no standing. We can do with them and their land as we will. That is not exaggeration. There are currently fights, uh, say that the San Carlos Apache in the southwestern United States are uh, fighting in order to preserve lands that are important to them from logging and mineral uh, exploitation. Same thing in the native, non public nation. This persists to this day. So let us go back to the uh, point that I was making here, which is chapter one of factor of production number one. How do we come to have this land in order to build our wealth? Jen O. Simon. Plain and clear. Chapter number two uh, has to do with a different and just as consequential land grab. And before I go to that one, let me just uh, help relieve some of the tension uh, in the room that comes from actually just speaking the truth. Uh, because a good friend of, of mine, Crystal Ekohawk, would just not forgive me if I didn't tell you that today's generation is doing everything they can to recover. Uh, that uh, if you sympathize, you know, they don't need anybody to feel sorry for them, but they do need allies. Uh, so she's formed an organization that is called Illuminators. And you can go to Illuminators' website, uh, and a very handy tool that she has on there is a guide for allies. What can the rest of us do in order to um, be of assistance to a population that has recovered from about the five million that there were in what today is the continental United States at the beginning of the era of colonization was cut down to less than 250,000 people in 1890. So you can see how decimation doesn't even begin to cover what was done to this population. It's now back uh, over about three million people. So they're looking for their own way uh, and trying to combat the erasure uh, of their folks. So again, uh, after going through that, it's really important to recognize initiatives like that. So it's the Illuminatives website. Let's take a look at chapter number two of land grabbing. And here I'll just uh, I'll spend less time here because the point is made. But uh, you know, when I came to Iowa, I'd, uh, I'd come from Mexico. I'd first of all done an undergraduate degree at New Mexico State University, but you know, came to the United States as a teenager, so I was fairly big, got my initial education in Mexico. And uh, in Mexico, believe you me, the Mexican-American War is a major part of our history. You study that. You understand the invasion of General Winfield Scott uh, down to Tampico and Veracruz and marching on Mexico City. You understand uh, what happened when General Sloat attacked from the south, hit Mazatlan, and then went up to what was Mexico at that time, Monterrey in California. There were four different major uh, invasions that resulted in Mexico losing 50% of its land at that period of time. Believe you me, we study that, we understand that. When I got to Iowa, it was a very interesting thing. Uh, Iowa became a state in 1846, the year of the Mexican-American War. And when they were naming counties, they did the obvious thing. They named counties after major figures or major battles of the Mexican-American War. So the president was James Polk, Des Moines sits in Polk County. Uh, Winfield Scott got his own county in Iowa, Scott uh, County. The major battles, um, Palo Alto got a county. Uh, Cerro Gordo got a county. Buena Vista uh, got a county. And believe me, coming from Mexico, I recognize all those things. It, that's what was in my face. Uh, but in Iowa, and you know, I lived in Iowa for nearly 30 years, and I lived in Mexico, as I told you, only until I was a teenager. So it is possible to identify with both Mexico and Iowa. I feel Iowa and I feel Midwestern. But let me tell you about, about Iowa. When they heard Mexican-American War, they were thinking about all these Mexicans invading Storm Lake. That's what the Mexican-American War is today uh, in Iowa. Not so much the commonality that we had and the fact that there's a, you know, uh, by my calculation, uh, billions of Mexicans in Iowa every year in the form of the corn that's grown there uh, every year. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a lot of commonality in terms of, of history and the major economic activity between Mexico and Iowa. But most Americans are not even aware of the fact that uh, this is how they came by what is today referred to as the West and the United States. It is why uh, you can, once you cross about this part of the world, uh, uh, you know, you essentially have to be conversant with Spanish to even talk about where you're going. You know, you may be uh, going to 
San Antonio, El Paso, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, Arizona, Colorado, Montana del Norte, California, Los Angeles, San Diego, Sacramento, Santa Fe. We could go on a long time. Because that was Mexico and New Spain far longer than it's been in the United States. For hundreds of years, it was Mexico and New Spain. So that was the second part of the land grab. And the president at the time, again, was very clear about it. It's of great importance to our country generally, and especially to our navigating and whaling industries that the Pacific Coast and indeed the whole of our territory west of the Rocky Mountains should speedily be filled up by hardy and patriotic populations. They were getting rid of Catholics. That, that was the rationale of the period of time. So it's sort of like today, uh, uh, fighting Muslims is the rationale for a lot of what is done across the planet. So as you know, at the period of time, uh, there was a name for this rationale. It wasn't that people weren't conscious of the fact that they needed this, what I keep referring to as the operating system to justify what was going on. And it was known as the idea of manifest destiny. And you've all seen the image many times. Uh, I'll just point out one of the dynamics in here, which is often missed, which is that as you go from your right to the left, what you see is lightness and civilization and progress replacing darkness and misery over on the left-hand side. And the darkness uh, side of the ledger, you see the Native American population being driven out. You see the buffalo, their source of sustenance, at least here for the grass people, being driven out. And you see the native ecosystem of that period of time being completely replaced by plows and what today we would recognize as modern uh, agriculture. And you see telegraphs and railroads, and every one of those is a result of a specific agricultural policy, the Homestead Act, the Transcontinental Railroad Act, the Morrill Act, and so on. So, engineered uh, results, and we're only talking so far about factor number one of production. Let's go to factor number two of production, and that's labor. So, uh, prior to the opening up, and uh, you'll just begin to insert when I use those words that we use today, you know, the opening up, the settlement, you know, always put those in, in quotations. Uh, the continent was peopled. And there were urban centers and high social development here. And we needed rationale in order to justify why we would take that over. Uh, you're uh, probably familiar with the uh, doctrine of discovery, which actually summarizes about 300 years of evolving justification and rationalization for taking over a people continent, which I can easily summarize for you, save you a lot of reading and study. Essentially, the rationale uh, as it evolved over those three centuries goes something like this. It is just we give ourselves permission to take your land because we are Christian and you are not. That's the rationale of the doctrines of discovery. And so land was taken care of by that particular rationale. Now let's go to factor production number two. At that time, the agriculture that was referred to as large-scale agriculture, uh, plantation agriculture, was the most arduous uh, uh, human labor that you can imagine in that era prior to mechanization. Think of the crops. Um, in sequence, in the United States, the major mercantile crops on the basis of which the industrial wealth of this country uh, was built were sugar, tobacco, cotton, rice. All required tremendous labor. I don't know if any of you have ever so much as just walked through a sugar cane plantation. Just walking through it, you'll suffer lots of violence, much less being in the middle of it, harvesting, processing, and so on. And the plantation owners were not going to do this work for themselves. So the solution was to abduct people from a completely different continent, separate families, transport them across the ocean in some of the most brutal conditions imaginable. Uh, uh, interesting uh, figure. Uh, to remark of about 300 years of this practice uh, is that more people died in this middle passage uh, than were killed uh, at Auschwitz during the Second World War. Uh, a total of about 12 million people were abducted over that uh, three centuries to provide the enslaved labor of the entire American continent during the period of colonization. Uh, a little bit over three million of them ended up in what is today the continental uh, United States. And so they provided that, you know, labor and were 
treated as property, treated as animals, kept under control by being terrorized, and even after emancipation, as you all are very familiar, uh, slavery continued in the language that was used in the South in another form. And so this was the Jim Crow era, where even though by letter of the law, these were free people, they were excluded explicitly from participating in the wealth that their labor had helped to create. And there were laws in place in order to assure that. And so one of those laws is you know, lived out by an institution like the one that we're in the midst of. The, um, the schools that were created by the Morrill Act uh, were not initially open to uh, Natives or African Americans. And people knew their place in society because we made sure that they knew their place in society. And again, analogous to the situation of the Native American experience, lest we think that that's history and that's in the past, uh, when it was very common that a form of entertainment was to go to the local lynching for often you know, minor offenses whose main purpose was to teach people their place in society. That sort of thing, if you know how to read headlines today, persists, and it persists quite actively. Um, here you see the case of Mr. Rashad Davis um, uh, just outside of St. Louis a few uh, years ago. I'm not going to do this justice because I've uh, you know, taken so long to get to this point, but as you know full well, this is a population that lives with the consequences that during the Jim Crow era, we were not going to extend the same labor protection and rights to African Americans as the rest of the population expected. So no overtime, no workman's compensation, no medical benefits, all of these were laughable propositions. Uh, the African American population found an escape valve, which is essentially to migrate uh, northwards, and it was necessary in order to drive industrial development in the United States. One key thing about the Morrill Act is that it would not have passed if it had not been uh, considered by Congress during the Civil War, because the South had seceded and they were dramatically opposed to the passage of the Morrill Act and the Homestead Act, both of these things. They saw the opening up of the West as an escape valve for some of the most skilled farmers and farm workers that existed at that period of time. They did not want the African-American population to know that they could go out and become farmers elsewhere. And so this, these acts only passed because the South seceded and was not able to vote on, on those pieces of law. But the consequences of all of this is that today's farm workers don't enjoy any of those benefits that were originally uh, exclusions to labor law, the Fair Labor Relations Act and other uh, laws like that. We specifically exclude people that work on farms. And so that means that the people that get exposed to the most toxic chemicals that we know of in agriculture and that work literally sun up to sundown in order to make sure that we have greens, that we have dairy, that we have processed meat, all of those, they don't enjoy any of those benefits. And they, according to the labor participation statistics that the Department of Labor keeps, nobody in this nation works harder than these folks do. And if you hire farm labor, you don't need statistics to know that. You know that. And so another exemption is that these folks can have their children in the field and often have no choice when everybody else needs to have their children in school, children as young as 12 years of age by law, and often against the law younger than that, can actually be out there in the field. Now, because these are explicit exemptions to law, we know exactly what we're doing. And we know to whom we're doing it. Now, so the upshot of this is that we wouldn't have meat, as I mentioned, we wouldn't have dairy, we wouldn't have the food prepared, we wouldn't have it served to us, we wouldn't have people to clean up after us, and meaning we wouldn't eat. No farm labor, no farms, no food, period. But yet, these folks are some of the most undervalued people, if not the most undervalued people in the entire agricultural system. Now, I need to run through the following relatively quickly here, and uh, let me see here, I, I'm going to skip that and give you an illustration of uh, what I mean about this. I'm going to jump to the state of North Carolina. And I'm going to tell you that the demand that we estimate uh, for farm workers in the United States is about a million per year. All of these figures are radically underestimated because it's the nature of the way that we young farm labor, we run farm labor, which is an explicitly exploitative sector of agriculture, that we don't really know the numbers and we don't really want to know the numbers. But the closest that we can get is that there's this demand for a million people per year. Uh, of these, we supply uh, what are referred to as guest workers, about 55,000. This is annual. And remember, these are all underestimates. 
For the state of Carolina, we have some fairly good numbers that were generated by the North Carolina Growers Association. And if you're interested, you can look at their report, International Harvest. But what they were looking at was an answer to the question, what is the domestic supply of labor? And could we actually meet the demand for labor uh, domestically? And let me explain to you a little bit of my rationale for showing you the statistics before we actually take a look at them. As I said, we know exactly what we're doing here. Uh, remember I told you that economics is a social science? I've lived long enough that I can see that we've changed our mind about aspects of economics. In the hard sciences, which are named that because they're predictable, uh, not because they're easy, but because you can uh, you know, run algorithms that will work most of the time. We can fly planes and develop all kinds of technology based on the hard science of the physical universe. You know? So the gravitational constant is what it is, the speed of light is what it is. But in economics, we change our minds all the time. We make up the rules that we need. So we abandon the gold standard, for instance. Sometimes we're free traders, sometimes we're protectionists, and so on and so forth. So when it comes to capital, we have decided, and I, within my lifetime, that capital can flow according to one of the most sacred precepts of economics, according to supply and demand. So if you today want to buy a banana plantation in Costa Rica, you can do that. If you have the money, buy it. Or somebody in Hong Kong can buy choice land, choice agricultural land in Minnesota. They can do that, and that happens. The freedom of capital to move across borders, that's something we decided could happen. And likewise, I'm able to make electrons jump through hoops and show you pretty pictures because we've decided that uh, goods, material goods, can go across borders. We can trade them freely. At least that's uh, an economic ideal by comparative advantage. So these can go across borders to meet supply and demand. But when it comes to labor, it is very convenient that labor can't move across borders according to supply and demand. So that's why I want to show you these, these data. So the North Carolina uh, Growers Association collects these data because of the fact that individual farmers can't comply with the law to get domestic workers without high overhead. You need to show that you've advertised for the job, that you didn't get sufficient domestic data workers to apply, and then you can apply to get a guest worker and go through all kinds of rigmarole. And so the, the Growers Association takes care of this collectively for farmers throughout the state of North Carolina. So what you see in this graph here are four different categories. It, the number of unemployed people, ostensibly the pool of people that could do agricultural work, followed by the number of people that are referred by the Department of Labor in the state of Carolina to do agricultural work, followed by those that actually began work, followed by those that actually finished the season. And I'm going to show you several different years, 98 through 2012, and notice that in the year 1998, the beginning, um, the number of unemployed in thousands was over 140,000 unemployed people. Uh, and that the number of referred workers was 112, the number that began work was 14, and none of them finished the season. Now, for a frame of reference, you should know that in North Carolina, the actual demand for workers every year is 6,500. So out of a pool of over 140,000 unemployed people, we need to find 6,500, and we find 112, 14 actually decide that they're going to try it, zero actually finish doing the, the work. That's in 1998. Now when you look at this throughout these years, notice that the first column I had to put out of proportion. If I actually showed you hundreds of thousands, then the other figures would disappear on the scale. So just remember that there's three orders of magnitude difference between the first column and the other three. And so now let's take a look at what happens over that period of time. And notice that this is during the uh, real estate bubble. So the number of unemployed dramatically ballooned. And so you would think that would mean that there's many more people that, you know, if they want to work for their living, would see the agricultural labor as a way to do that. And instead, the best that ever happened over that period of time was that 140 people were referred, began work, and only 10 finished the season. So when you hear these people are taking our jobs, just remember that reality. And remember that it's very convenient that we have made the laws so that they cannot actually have legal standing. So when their wages are garnished, when they don't uh, actually receive the wages that they were promised, when women are raped in the field or abused in the uh, poultry factory, what are they going to do? They can't sue. And if you decide you're going to pay them only $9, when the law says they should be paid $15, what are they going to do? 
It's a very convenient system. They tell you that this is slavery by another name. Now, so they obviously fight for their rights in ways that they can, namely people that have US citizenship, try to represent the interests of all of them. Now, I need to wind this up, but I did promise you that we would see this once again. When you see this, remind yourself, when you see statistics like this in the 21st century of the United States, remind yourself that this is social engineering. This didn't just happen. Remember the factors of production. Land, labor, and how you end up with financial capital. And remember that the system was set up for some of us, not for all of us. The same with the conference as partners, allies. And that if you want to redo the way that agriculture looks, it shouldn't be just about the way that the landscape changes. If you believe in the things that you tell yourself about what this country is and what country you want to be a part of, then how agriculture looks in terms of the people and who benefits from it also needs to change. And because the two are related, you know the tremendous change, the ethical change that is going to be required in order for the way that the land looks to change. That means a total redesign of the agricultural system. Our investments, our values, the criteria for what is good. If we're going to do that, then at the same time, that should apply to who the people are that are involved and who's going to benefit from this enterprise of agriculture. What you're looking at here is the roadkill on the way to creating the modern system of agriculture. None of these populations would either be here or be in the economic conditions that I've described where not for agriculture, the food system. It's the explanation for the dynamic that you see here. And remember what I've said, literally, this is a system created by some people for themselves, excluding others. Some of us are just here to serve that main population. And you can tell that in our language. We talk about minorities, which implies minor concerns. We talk about being tolerant of minorities. Tolerance means you put up with. That's no virtue, particularly when these folks were necessary to create everybody else's wealth. When you hear words such as the less fortunate, the socially disadvantaged, the underserved, do not put up with it. None of those words are true. These are the people who are the descendants of people whose lands were taken, whose ancestors were massacred, whose labor was appropriated, to this day, whose labor is exploited. That's what needs to be said. That's what we shouldn't tolerate. That's what needs to be changed. Now, let me give you some parting words. I told you that there would be some uh, constructive uh, punchlines here. And so I, I want to remark on a line from this document, which you all are familiar with, which is the claim that one of the key premises of establishing this country is the belief that all men are created equal. By the way, I'm not transliterating that. They literally meant men. And because I've run out of time here, I, I won't expound on that. They literally meant uh, rich or gentry, land-owning uh, men of that period of time. But what they claimed was that everyone was created equal. When Lincoln ran for office, uh, which is such a watershed moment in US history because it created uh, today's agricultural system in many ways, uh, he ran against this young man, Senator Stevens. And let me quote you something that Senator Stevens said during the campaign for president. In my opinion, this government of ours is founded on the white basis. It was made by the white man for the benefit of the white man to be administered by white men. I am opposed to taking any step that recognizes the Negro man or the Indian as the equal of the white man. So Stephen Douglas wasn't confused. He was very clear about where he stood. Now, the thing about this is that today in the 21st century, when people say exactly the same thing, out of the White House, we get them described as very fine people. This sort of thing is not history. This sort of thing is the sort of thing that we can take a stand on and are required to take a stand on every day in order to build the future that we all want. So let me recommend to you several things that I think we need to uh, work on collectively. I know I'm making Aaron nervous here, so let me just uh, find what I promised to you is the last slide here. I'll give you my recommendation. Um, there is a uh, practice that uh, you often find at conferences. 
that I think is all to the good, and it's well-meaning. Uh, but uh, you will see that I've uh, basically have had it with, and uh, it is the point of what I want to recommend to you, and this is the practice of doing land acknowledgments. You know, you've all been to these uh, meetings, you know, where at the beginning, somebody well-meaning gets up and they read to you out of the Wikipedia page, you know, who the people were that 300 years ago. They can't pronounce the name, they don't quite understand the history, but, you know, it feels virtuous to get up there and do this performative thing where you acknowledge, oh, this is the land, you know, where the Anishinaabe used to have it, so we want to acknowledge that. It may sound like I'm making fun of it, I'm just very quickly summarizing to you how it feels, what it is, and how performative that is. The reason for that is that you can go through that, you can feel virtuous, and after that, nothing changes. You still have their land. You're still benefiting from the wealth of having that land. They still don't have their land. They're still in despair because we've excluded them explicitly from the current fiber. And so let's stop doing that unless we intend to do something about it. And so let me give you some examples of that. So uh, South Dakota State, they're attempting to do something about this. It's a very difficult enterprise. All agricultural colleges are built on the wealth of a land grant that the federal government gave of land that was stolen from Native Americans. South Dakota State, they're attempting to work with the Native Dakota and Nakota to recognize that. And to say, with the wealth from some of this land, we would like to create programs, this is a university, that will benefit the Native American population. You help us design the educational systems that you believe that you need. And the ultimate would be to take some of that land and actually return it to the native population for purposes that they define would be useful to them. These are really difficult things, but conceptually they're trying. That's doing something uh, about it. Uh, at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we have a, a project on tribal sovereignty. We're, what we're attempting to do is to get more federal funds through the National Institute for Food and Agriculture to support research into agroecology and native foodways led by folks at tribal colleges, which just like the so-called 1890, you know, the black serving land grant uh, schools, are a perfect testimony that we have separate and unequal systems embedded still by present law. And so because they're the B team, they get fewer resources to perform what we do at 1862 schools like this one. So we're working to make sure that we reverse it, that we do something uh, about that. There's an example of doing something about it with leadership from the Native uh, communities. But let me just summarize three things that would be transformational if we all worked with them while we're attempting to change the way that the surface of the land looks in agricultural purposes. Uh, first of all, we just need to talk about land reform. Who holds the land? There's a way that you can do this which is all wrong. Think Zimbabwe, you know, which is forced removal. You don't want to compound uh, injustices. However, all of you are either in the following situation or are witnesses to it or know about it. Because of the bankruptcy of the current industrial system and that poverty of the imagination that I described to you, there are many families that are saying we have a fifth, sixth generation farm. I'm recommending to you, daughter, son, don't do this. Become a software engineer. Do anything. And what do we do with the land? Uh, land trust, uh, you know, an easement, uh, give it to the agricultural colleges. We actually need to recognize that there's a transfer of land that is happening because the system is not working for the majority of people in it, and that that's an opportunity to rethink what we do with that land, how we manage it, who manages it, and that there are people that would want to get into it with different ideas. So it's not just a matter of repopulating the agricultural system, but reimagining how agriculture works with different people, with a different vision. So we're not, we're actually way behind what Canada is doing with truth and reconciliation, which they patterned on what South Africa did, which South Africa patterned on what the Germans did. They actually have done very good work in reparations in both South Africa and Germany. I recommend a very recent book, which is called What We Can Learn from the Germans in terms of these reparations. And of course, you understand historically, for all the difficulties it has created, the nation of Israel has one big, massive reparation uh, to Jewish people. 
So we need to be thinking about that. Uh, every year, uh, uh, formerly uh, Congressman Conyers, who recently passed away, and now Sheila Lee in his place, passes a resolution in Congress, House Resolution Number 40, to establish a commission to study how we might do reparations. So that we account for the fact that over generations, some of us built wealth, some of us had redlining, exclusion from loans and credit programs and land theft and so on. So over generations, some of us got wealthy, some of us got poor. So we need to study how to amend for that. And people that are building our wealth without whom the food system wouldn't be possible should at least, if they desire, have a pathway to citizenship. So our immigration policies need to recognize the food system does not work without that currently exploited farm labor. And we need to do the right thing for the people that are putting food on our table. So I want to leave you with one uh, final thought. And before Aaron comes up, you can indulge me. Um, I want to ask you to take just five seconds to meditate again on this thought. You've been very patient this morning. Thank you very much.